So, dear graduates, congratulations on the completion of your respective programs, on what you have learned, on your degrees, and on what I hope will be promising futures ahead as you pursue science. You've accomplished a great deal already in the obtaining of your degree, and that at a center of learning in epidemiology that is highly regarded throughout the world. There were no doubt challenges, a large body of material to master, methods to learn, data to synthesize, research to undertake. And you ought to take pride in your accomplishments. However, much of life and your work in science still lies ahead. You've made it through many challenges. There are many more to come. I have been asked today to give an address on advice to young scientists. I generally consider myself at present in that category of person. And so my advice to you today will be as much directed to myself as it is to all of you. I've spent some time reflecting on what lessons or advice or counsel I would have in retrospect appreciated receiving around the time of my own degree, and also on what advice I need to remind myself of and take to heart today. And it is this that I share with you. I will give my advice in the form of four counsels. My first counsel may seem obvious, but it has its challenges. It is continue to learn continue to read broadly, continue to acquire knowledge. You might well think, and rightly so, will this not just happen by the very nature of my profession as a scientist? Will I not be seeking out knowledge by the very nature of my work in science? And of course, it is so. But what I recommend is somewhat broader. It is to learn in areas and in fields of study in which you are not specifically working in. And this can be more challenging. Science has often progressed by increasing specialization, by dividing knowledge into smaller and smaller compartments, by the development of highly targeted tools and deeper understanding to answer ever more precise questions. And in many ways, this has been a grand success. Knowledge, as it is often pointed out, has grown exponentially and continues to do so. Articles and journals proliferate. If you search on most topics, even specialized narrow topics, you will be amazed at all that we collectively know. And it is for this reason that to truly contribute to knowledge, to science, one must master a great deal of preceding material, to come to the frontiers of knowledge, of science, to make one's own advance. This again has worked out very well in the generation of knowledge, and it's likely what you'll spend much of your time pursuing subsequently relatively specialized contributions to science. But there are dangers, both to science and to the scientist. To the scientist, there is the danger of too narrow a vision. With specialization, there comes deeper understanding, but there's also an intense focus on a set of very narrow questions. There's the danger of losing sight of the big picture, the broader significance, of one's work, and in being able to make connections between ideas, between areas of inquiry, even across disciplines or fields. To do so requires broad reading. It requires the broad acquisition of knowledge. Isaac Newton was not only a master of mathematics and physics and optics, but wrote also on theology and even alchemy. Descartes, who we usually think of as a philosopher, made contributions also to geometry and to optics. Gregor Mendel not only advanced our knowledge in genetics and botany, but was also trained in mathematics and was a priest. Perhaps these are exceptions. We can still, however, perhaps pursue something similar, but more modest. Our vision of the learned scientist or the wise professor is often one who knows a great deal about many things, who has a near comprehensive understanding of his or her entire discipline, who sees how everything fits together. Increasingly, achieving such broad understanding has become ever more difficult as our collective base of knowledge continues to rapidly expand. The best we can do, then, is to try. To try to continue to learn and read broadly in our discipline, and across disciplines, 
From the perspective of the acquisition of knowledge, doing so can be quite rewarding. It is often much easier and faster to learn about what is already known than to try to establish new knowledge oneself through one's own research. And yet, reading and learning the work of others also has its costs. Increasingly, in the modern academy at least, faculty and scientists are more often rewarded and promoted on the grounds of what new knowledge they have contributed rather than on what they know and how deeply they understand. But without broad knowledge and understanding, we risk losing sight of how everything fits together. We risk losing sight of how science itself can contribute towards the good. And we risk even not seeing connections between ideas which may lead us to new and important discoveries. And so I encourage you, continue to learn, continue to read broadly, continue to acquire knowledge. My second counsel is this, be committed to the pursuit of truth. Once again, this advice may seem obvious. Are we not, as scientists, in some sense, always seeking after truth? And once again, it is so. But the pursuit of truth in our epidemiologic observational studies is complicated. We do not often have in epidemiology definitive conclusions. We more typically have some sort of statistical conclusion from which we try to infer truth. We need to be careful then in our interpretation and in our inferences. We ought to examine the robustness of our results to different methods and the sensitivity of our conclusions to the violations of the assumptions that we make. We should consider and even seek out all other possible explanations for our results other than that to which we most naturally think they point. We should try to be skeptical of our own work. In other words, as best as possible, we should critically evaluate the evidence and determine how strongly it does or does not point to the conclusion we think it does. We should be committed to truth. Once again, the academic incentives are not wholly aligned with this pursuit of truth. Scientists are rewarded uh, more often, at least in the short run, on the basis of publications. But publishing is not the end of science. The end to which science aspires is, again, truth. And so we must be careful. At the very least, we ought not publish studies we know to be false. A survey of academics not long ago, in which responses were made anonymous to encourage honesty, suggested that in one social science discipline, about half of all academic respondents had published at least one paper they knew was wrong at the time of publication. If we do not believe in our own work, we should not, for the most part, be disseminating it. Certainly not without also making clear what our doubts are and what other explanations might be. Belief in our results in no way is sufficient for those results to be reliable, as uh, the work, say, of John Eonites in his paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, and in his subsequent work shows. But again, we should at the very least critically examine our results and ask whether we believe them. We should be critical of our own work. And my second counsel is thus, be committed to truth. It is in this way that science will best progress. My third counsel is this, seek the good. For some, though perhaps not all of you, you will have considerable choice over what to study, what to pursue, what to work on. In an academic context, the possibilities are almost endless. For all of you, you will likely have some measure of choice concerning where to work, for whom to work, on the nature of your employment and its goals and ends. And all these decisions, so far as it depends on you, I counsel again, seek what is good. As best as possible, pursue that which seems as though it will contribute to human flourishing, human well-being, to the alleviation of suffering, to health. This may not always be what is easiest to pursue or what is easiest to publish or what will most advance your career. But it is my belief that it will be what is most satisfying. It will be what you feel best about as a person. It will be what you look back upon many years later and take pride in what you have done. 
A study reported by sociologist Anthony Campalo was conducted amongst those approaching the very end of their lives and asked respondents if they had life to do over again, what would they do differently? The three most common responses were to reflect more, to risk more, and to return more. To return more, you have earned a distinguished academic degree. You have been equipped with the ability to return to and contribute to society, to the lives of those around you. And it is this returning, the seeking of the good, that those at the end of their lives wished they had done more of. And this returning, the seeking of the good, is of course also related to the other two responses, to risk and to reflect. Pursuing the good, knowing what will contribute, is often not obvious. It requires reflection. And pursuing the good is not without its risks. Science that contributes may be slow. It may take time. And it will often be subject to failure. It requires being willing to risk. As I look back on my own empirical research, it is those papers that have had the potential to help shape society for the better, that have perhaps guided intervention, rather than those that have been published in the most prestigious journals, of which I am most proud. Truth is, of course, also a good, and I believe knowledge pursued as its own end is of value, but some truths are more central to human flourishing than others. Spend time in reflection, then, on what matters most to you, on where you can do the most good. It is where the world's needs intersect your abilities and position that you will find a calling. Amidst what will likely be busy, productive careers, pause from time to time and ask whether what you are doing is truly what you want to pursue and consider most of value. Pursue the good. And my fourth and final counsel is to acknowledge the limits of science. Acknowledge the limits of what we can know and of what science can contribute to our knowledge. Our conclusions in epidemiology are often statistical in nature. Our models, a simplification of reality, our measures imperfect. We should thus be humble about what we can accomplish through science. We can sometimes approach truth, but other times only make limited progress. This is complicated enough with precisely defined diseases and biomarkers. It is more difficult still when we move to imprecise conglomerates of illness, as in psychiatric epidemiology. And it is often more challenging yet still in fields such as social epidemiology, with sometimes ill-defined social exposures and outcomes. Some of my own res recent research has been on the relationships between religious participation and health. In this work, I'm often amazed at what we can know, or at least contribute evidence towards. Um, but I'm also amazed at what we cannot know, at what defies our ability to measure. We can, can accomplish a great deal in our use of the scientific method, but we also must understand that our capacity to know is limited. And we should acknowledge also the limits, not just of our capacity to know, but of the scope of science itself. Scientific pursuit has made the world around us much clearer. But many fundamental questions in life. How am I to live my life? What is good? What is justice? How do I find meaning in life? And such are not answerable by the methods of science. We must be open to other forms of knowing. Science is limited in scope. Finally, I would counsel acknowledging the limits of science in the broader picture of your own lives. You have made it as far as you have today because you have been devoted to the pursuit of learning, because you have been disciplined and spent considerable time mastering the ideas and concepts and content and methods of epidemiology. And with the same devotion, you will likely go on to accomplish a great many other things and do a great deal of good. But recognize there is more to your own life than work. There is family, there is friendship, there is beauty, there is rest, there is the seeking of what is transcendent. These things are among those that are most important in life. 
By all means, continue to seek and pursue your science and do so devotedly and diligently. But make space also for these other things in life. Participate in, delight in, rejoice, celebrate, and rest in those goods that you are seeking to help others achieve also in your work and in your science. In giving science its proper place, you will be better able to pursue science and better also able to pursue life. So, continue to learn. Be committed to truth. Seek the good and give science its proper place, acknowledging also its limits. It is this that constitutes my advice today to young scientists and my advice to myself and with which I still struggle. It is my belief that the pursuit of these councils will lead to better science and I hope also to a fuller life. Thank you and congratulations once again.